Hi everybody! So today we're going to start the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. I'm so excited. I know I say this about almost every book we put on this channel, but this is another one of my favorites from when I was in school. So I can't wait to get started and to share this with you. Chapter 1 Lucy Looks Into a Wardrobe once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, ten miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. He had no wife and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McCready and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they do not come into the story much. He himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair which grew over most of his face as well as on his head, and they liked him almost at once. But on the first evening when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd-looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him, and Edmund, who was the next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. As soon as they had said good night to the professor and gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our feet in no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what, said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm to go to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed? said Lucy. There's sure to be a row if we're heard talking up here. No, there won't, said Peter. I'll tell you this. Sorry, I tell you this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes walk from here down to that dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise? said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she had ever been in before, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along in the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when next morning came, there was a steady rain falling, so thick that when you looked out the window, you could see neither the mountains, nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them. A long, low room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Ten to one, it'll clear up in an hour or so. And in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore in the house. Everyone agreed to this. And that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors they tried led only into spare bedrooms, as everyone had expected that they would. But soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armor. And after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner, and then came three steps down and five steps up and then a kind of little upstairs hall, and a door that led out on the balcony, and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books, and some bigger than a Bible in church. 
and shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty, except for one big wardrobe. The sort that has a long glass, a long looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again. All except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it is very foolish to shut oneself into any wardrobe. Soon she went in, further in, and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there, and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as not to bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel the woodwork against the tips of her fingers. But she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the sofa folds out of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder is that more mothballs? She thought, stomping down to feel it with her, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. Next moment she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it's just like the branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away, where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe, and even catch a, a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it was a very silly thing to shut oneself into a wardrobe. It seemed to still be daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch over the snow and through the wood towards the other light. In about 10 minutes, she reached it and found it was a lamp post. As she stood looking at it, wondering why there was a lamp post in the middle of a wood and wondering what to do next, she heard a pitter patter of feet coming towards her. And soon after that, a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamp post. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upwards, he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like goats. The hair on them was glossy black, and instead of feet, he had goat's hooves. He also had a tail. But Lucy did not notice this at first, because it was neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella, so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler around his neck, and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant little face, with a short pointed beard and curly hair. And out of the hair there stuck two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella. In the other arm, he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels in the snow, it looked just as if he had been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn. And when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all his parcels. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn. Chapter 2. What Lucy Found There. 
Good evening, said Lucy. But the fawn was so busy picking up its parcels that at first it did not reply. When it had finished, it made her a little bow. Good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive, but should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My name's Lucy, said she, not quite understanding him. But you are, for forgive me, you are what they call a girl, said the fawn. Of course I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are, in fact, human. Of course I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the fawn. How stupid of me. But I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve before. I am delighted, that is to say. And then it stopped, as if it had been going to say something that it had not intended, but had remembered in time. Delighted, delighted, it went on. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tumnus. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. And may I ask, O oh Lucy, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, how you have come into Narnia? Narnia? What's that? said Lucy. This is the land of Narnia, said the fawn, where we are now. All that lies between the, that lamppost and the great castle of Caer Paravel on the eastern sea. And you, you have come from the wild woods of the west? I, I got in through the wardrobe in the spare room, said Lucy. Ah, said Mr. Tumnus in a rather melancholy voice. If only I had worked harder at geography when I was a little fawn, I should no doubt know all, th all about those strange countries. It is too late now. But they aren't countries at all, said Lucy, almost laughing. It's only just back there, at least. I'm not sure. It is summer there. Meanwhile, said Mr. Tumnus, it is winter in Narnia, and has been for ever so long. And we shall both catch cold if we stand here talking in the snow. Daughter of Eve from the far land of Sparum, where eternal summer reigns around the bright city of Wardrobe, how would it be if you came and had tea with me? Thank you very much, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. It's only just around the corner, said the fawn, and there'll be a roaring fire and toast and sardines and cake. Well, it's very kind of you, said Lucy, but I shan't be able to stay long. If you will take my arm, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tumnus, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That's the way. Now, off we go. And so Lucy found herself walking through the wood, arm in arm with this strange creature, as if they had known one another all their lives. They had not gone far before they came to a place where the ground became rough, and there were rocks all about, and little hills up and little hills down. At the bottom of one small valley, Mr. Tumnus turned suddenly aside, as if he were going to walk straight into an unusually large rock. But at the last moment, Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, she found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. Then Mr. Tumnus stooped and took a flaming piece of wood out of the fire with a neat little pair of tongs and lit a lamp. Now we shan't be long, he said, and immediately put a kettle on. Lucy thought she had never been in a nicer place. It was a little, dry, clean cave of reddish stone with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs. One for me and one for a friend, said Mr. Tumnus. In a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire, and above that a picture of an old fawn with a gray beard. In one corner there was a door, which Lucy thought must lead to Mr. Tumnus's bedroom, and on one wall was a shelf full of books. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like The Life and Letters of Selenus or Nymphs, and Their Ways or Men, Monks and Gamekeepers, A Study in Popular Legend, or Is Man a Myth? Now, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, and really it was a wonderful tea. Oops, I just lost my spot. Sorry. <laughs> and really it was a wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled for each of them, and then sardines on toast, 
and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then a sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the deer dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns, about long hunting parties after the milk-white stag who could give you wishes if you caught him, about feasting and treasure, seeking with the wild red dwarfs in deep mines and caverns far beneath the forest floor, and then about summer when the woods were green and old Salinas on his fat donkey would come to visit them, and sometimes Bacchus himself and then the streams would run with wine instead of water, and the whole forest would give itself up to the jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now, he said gloomily. Then to cheer himself up, he took out from its case on the dresser a strange little flute that looked as if it were made of straw and began to play. And the tune he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. It must have been hours later when she shook herself and said, Oh, Mr. Tumnus, I'm so sorry to stop you, and I do love that tune, but really, I must go home. I only meant to stay for a few minutes. It's no good now, you know, said the fawn, laying down its flute and shaking its head at her very sorrowfully. No good, said Lucy, jumping up and feeling rather frightened. What do you mean? I've got to go home at once. The others will be wondering what has happened to me. But a moment later, she asked, Mr. Tumnus, whatever is the matter? For the fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears, and then the tears began trickling down its cheeks, and soon they were running off the end of its nose, and at last it covered its face with its hands and began to howl. Mr. Tumnus, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy in great distress. Don't, don't, what is the matter? Aren't you well? Dear Mr. Tumnus, do tell me what is wrong. But the fawn continued sobbing, as if its heart would break. And even when Lucy went over and put her arms round him and lent him her handkerchief, he did not stop. He merely took the handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be of any use, so that presently Lucy was standing in a damp patch. Mr. Tumnus, bawled Lucy in his ear, shaking him. Do stop. Stop it at once. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big fawn like you. What on earth are you crying about? Oh, 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 sobbed Mr. Tumnus. I'm crying because I'm such a bad fawn. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you are a very good fawn. You are the nicest fawn I've ever met. Oh, oh, you wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there will ever was a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done? asked Lucy. My old father, now, said Mr. Tumnus, that his picture, that's his picture over the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like this. A thing like what? said Lucy. Like what I've done, said the fawn. Taken service under the white witch. That's what I am. I'm in the pay of the white witch. The white witch? Who is she? Why, it is she that goes, that has got all Narnia under her thumb. It's she that makes it always winter. Always winter and never Christmas. Think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you for? That's the worst of it, said Mr. Tumnus with a deep groan. I'm a kidnapper for her, that's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Would you believe that I'm the sort of fawn to meet a poor innocent girl in the wood? one that had never done me any harm and pretend to be friendly with it and invite it home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it asleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy. I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort. But I have, said the fawn. Well, said Lucy rather slowly, for she wanted to be truthful and yet not to be too hard on him. Well, that was pretty bad, but you're so sorry for it that I'm sure you will never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand, said the fawn. It's something I have done. I'm doing it now, this very moment. What do you mean, cried Lucy, turning very white. You are the child, said Tumnus. 
I had orders from the White Witch that if I ever saw a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve in the wood, I was to catch them and hand them over to her. And you were the first I've ever met. And I've pretended to be your friend and asked you to tea. And all the time, I've been meaning to wait till you were asleep and then go and tell her. Oh, but you wouldn't, Mr. Tomnus, said Lucy. You won't, will you? Indeed, indeed, you really mustn't. And if I don't, he said, beginning to cry again, she's sure to find out. And she'll have my tail cut off, and my horn sawn off, and my beard plucked out, and she'll wave her hand over my beautiful clove hooves and turn them into horrid, solid hooves like wretched horses. And if she is extra and if she is extra and specially angry, she'll turn me into a stone, and I shall be only statue of a fawn in her horrible house, until the four thrones at Care Paravel are filled with goodness, knows when that will happen, or whether it will ever happen again. I'm very sorry, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, but please let me go home. Of course I will, said the fawn. Of course I've got to, I see that now. I hadn't known what humans were like before I met you. Of course I can't give you to the White Witch, not now that I know you. But we must be off at once. I'll see you back to the lamp post. I suppose you can find your way from there back to spare oom and wardrobe. I'm sure I can, said Lucy. We must go as quietly as we can, Mr. Tominus said. The whole wood is full of her spies. Even some of the trees are on her side. They both got up and left the tea things on the table. And Mr. Tumnus once more put up his umbrella and gave Lucy his arm, and they went out into the snow. The journey back was not at all like the journey to the Fawn's cave. They stole along as quickly as they could without speaking a word, and Mr. Tumnus kept to the darkest places. Lucy was relieved when they reached the lamp post again. Do you know your way home from here, daughter of Eve? said Tumnus. Lucy looked very hard between the trees and could just see in the distance a patch of light that looked like daylight. Yes, she said, I can see the wardrobe door. Then be off home as quick as you can, said the fawn. And can you forgive me for what I meant to do? Why, of course I can, said Lucy, shaking him heartily by the hand. And I do hope you won't get into dreadful trouble on my account. Farewell, daughter of Eve, he said. Perhaps I may keep the handkerchief? Rather, said Lucy, and then ran towards the far-off patch of daylight as quickly as her legs would catch, carry her. And presently, instead of rough branches brushing past her, she felt coats. And instead of crunchy snow under her feet, she felt wood boards. And all at once, she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe, in the same empty room from which the whole adventure had started. She shut the wardrobe door tightly behind her and looked around, panting for breath. It was still raining, and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back. I'm all right. So that's where I'm going to leave you guys today. Very interesting chapter. I know we ran a little bit longer than usual, but it was all worth it because tomorrow we'll be able to start chapter three when the real adventure will begin. Bye.